In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is another martyr. Shortly after the birth of Christ, we had St. Stephen the very day after. And today we have, yesterday was the Holy Innocents. Some say up to 14,000 boys were slaughtered by Herod. And today is another martyr. All this bloodshed for the love of Christ after his birth, which is to remind us we must be ready to sacrifice even our life for the love of Christ and defense of the Holy Catholic Church of tradition and all virtue. So let's look a bit into this life of St. Thomas Becket. He was Archbishop of Canterbury. He was martyred in 1170. 350 years later, another Henry will put to death another St. Thomas, St. Thomas More. And that Henry VIII, in 1530s, he will send troops to Canterbury to dig up the body that was in the, buried in the cathedral of the Archbishop, uh, the Canterbury Cathedral, and dig it up and burn it and scatter the ashes of St. Thomas Becket. Now, some say, I was there at the cathedral, and some say that the, the monks knew that they were going to take the body of St. Thomas Becket, and some of them dug it up and hid the body before the soldiers could get there. So, we'll find out what's, what's true, but no one knows where the body really is now, if they hid it. But when you go into the, the, Arch, the Canterbury Cathedral, it's truly magnificent, it's gigantic. And it, it was built, of course, for the Catholic Mass. And then the Anglicans stole it under the Henry VIII. But when you walk in, you, you, if you started walking in up through the main doors up the main aisle, you have the main altar, and you have many side altars, and then you would go to the left side, which would be the, the Gospel side, which is another chapel. Which, is, which was where St. Thomas Becket was chanting Vespers when they martyred him. And he came out to face his murderers, the four men, uh, the soldiers of Henry II, and they, they killed him right there in the cathedral. So on the very spot where he was killed, martyred, there's a big, a big um, marble slab in the floor that says Thomas. St. Thomas was, was martyred right here. So the details of his death are very well known and has been, had been handed down. So let's look quickly at his life. His father's name was Gilbert. His mother's name was Matilda. And when he was a boy, He was born on St. Thomas's Day, which was Jan, uh, December 21st in the year 1118 in the city in London. And he was sent to school with the canons regular of Merton in Surrey. When he was 21, he lost his mother and soon after his father. He, so those who instructed him after he learned how to hunt he was a good hunter he learned how to play many uh, sport games probably in those days cricket was probably big one day when he was in pursuit of a game doesn't say what the animal was but he was cha chasing some animal his hawk made a stoop at a duck and dived after it into a river St. Thomas, as a boy, fearing to lose his hawk, leaped into the water, and the rapid stream carried him down to a mill where he was saved only by the sudden stopping of the wheel, which appeared miraculous. This incident is characteristic of St. Thomas's impetuosity rather than a cause of his taking life more seriously. When he was about 24, he obtained a post in the household of Theobald, who was Archbishop of Canterbury. He received minor orders and was greatly favored by the Archbishop Theobald and saw to it that St. Thomas was provided with a number of benefices from Beverly 
to Shoreham. In 1154, he was ordained deacon, and the archbishop nominated him archdeacon of Canterbury, which was then the first ecclesiastical dignity in England after the bishoprics and abbacies. So he quickly scaled up. And one of the monasteries he used to visit and often pray at and study at was not far from where the editor of the Recusant lives with his wife in, in Streatham. And, it's, and that monastery now is completely leveled. Now it's just business businesses there. All that's left is, is one of the stone, uh, stone walls that surrounded the monastery. Otherwise, it was completely leveled, thanks to the Protestants. So St. Thomas, rising up in the ranks, he always stood for what was true. He always stood for what was in honor of the defense of the Catholic Church. And he would eventually come to clash with his old friend, Henry II. And as, as young men, they were friends, they would hunt together, they would do a lot of things together. And the first of their conflicts when he became chancellor, which was one of the high ranks again, in spite of some differences, Henry II still showed his friend, Thomas Becket, some great marks of favor and seemed to still love him as he had done from their first acquaintance. The first serious sign of displeasure happened at Woodstock when the king was holding his court there. It was customary to pay two shillings a year upon every hide of land to the sheriffs of the counties who in return protected the contributors against the rapacity of minor officials. It apparently was graft of the worst kind. This sum the king ordered to be paid into his execre. The archbishop remonstrated that it was a voluntary payment, which could not be exacted as a revenue of the crown, adding, so as St. Thomas said to him, to the king, if the sheriffs, their sergeants, and officers defend the people, we shall pay, otherwise not. The king replied with an oath, by God's eye, this shall be paid. And St. Thomas answered, by the reverence of those eyes, my lord king, not a penny shall be paid from my lands. So here's the first, the first um, knocking of horns. Henry said no more at that time, but his resentment was roused. Then came the affair of Philip de Bois, a canon, a priest, who was accused of murder. According to, law, to the law of those times, he was tried in the ecclesiastical court and was acquitted by the Bishop of Lincoln. But a king's justice in ire, Simon Fitzpeter, then tried to bring him before his own court. Philip refused to plead and addressed Fitzpeter in insulting terms. Thereupon, Henry ordered him to be tried both for the former murder and the latter, the later misdemeanor. So this is a priest, and he has to be judged in an ecclesiastical court with bishops and judged by the church law, not by the state. So Henry is saying, no, I'll, I'm, I'm going to judge him. The state is a state affair now. So St. Thomas pressed for the case to come before his own court, and the king reluctantly agreed. Philip's plea of previous acquittal was accepted for the murder, but for the contempt of court, he was sentenced to be flogged and suspended for a time from his benefice. The king thought the sentence too mild and said to the assessors, By God's eye you shall swear that you did not spare him because he was a cleric. They offered to swear it, but Henry was not satisfied. So, again, we were, were watching uh, St. Thomas as, as Archbishop of Canterbury he, and Chancellor. He was already butting heads for the defense of the church. Accumulations of conflicts of, this, of these kinds provoked him in October 1163 
to a call by which all the bishops were called to a council in Westminster at which the king demanded his handing over of criminal clergy to the civil power for punishment. So here he's stepping into the church authority. He's taking authority he doesn't have, the king. Just like the state in the last few, few years were stepping into a realm they had no business determining how many go to mass, determining if, there, if the churches could be opened or closed, that kind of thing. And the, none of the bishops in the U.S. stood up to Biden, not one. And they should have. But many, at least some traditional priests continued. And in the case of Father Burfitt and I think Father Kevin Robinson, they won their case against the governors. They brought them to court. So that was the right thing to do because the state has no business interfering into the church affairs. So here in England in 1163, the bishops wavered, but St. Thomas strengthened them to not waver. Then Henry the King II required a promise of observance of his unspecified royal customs. St. Thomas and the council agreed, but saving their order, so far as the king's object was concerned, this was equivalent to a refusal, and the next day he ordered St. Thomas to give up certain castles and honors which he had held since he was chancellor. In a stormy interview at Northampton, the king in vain tried to make his old friend modify his attitude, and the trouble came to a head at the Council of Clarendon near Salisbury at the beginning of 1164. For a brief space, St. Thomas, having received little encouragement from Pope Alexander III, was very conciliatory and promised to accept the customs. But, while he wa while he, but when he saw the con constitutions in which were expressed the royal customs which he was to uphold, St. Thomas Becket exclaimed, By the Lord Almighty, no seal of mine shall be put to them. They provided, among other things, that no prelate should leave the kingdom of England without the royal license or appeal to Rome without the king's consent. No tenant-in-chief was to be excommunicated against the royal will. The custody of vacant benefices and their revenues was to be held by the king, and so forth and so forth. So what you got here is... King Henry II already starting to act like Henry VIII, who will succeed him 350 years later. And he's starting to interfere in the church's business. So St. Thomas Becket, again, held his ground. The archbishop was bitterly remorseful for having weakened in his opposition to the king and setting an example which the other bishops were too, too ready to follow. I am a proud, vain man, a feeder of birds and follower of hounds, he said, and I have been made a shepherd of sheep. I am fit only to be cast out of the sea which I fill. For forty days and more, while awaiting absolution and permission from the Pope, he would not celebrate Mass. He tried assiduously to heal the breach, but Henry the Second, king, now pursued him with persecution, which called which culminated in a suit for 30,000 marks, alleged to be owing from the time when he was chancellor. So on and on and on, this is all building up. And it's not directly questions of the faith, but they, they hinge on questions of the faith. The church and state have a distinction. They're not to be separate. They're to work together. But the state doesn't have the right to interfere in the questions of the church. And that's what Henry was doing. So this is all building up and building up. And St. Thomas eventually will have to flee from the threats to Europe. He would flee to France and go see the Pope. And the Pope, of course, encouraged him. And then he would go to the Cistercians. Uh, the Cistercian Monastery in Citeaux in France. And then finally, um, the gates opened for England, and St. Thomas was told he could come back to Canterbury to his diocese. And it's here that 
the friction just continued to increase. Here is the account of his martyrdom. And this was the culminating point of the conflict with Henry. On St. John's Day, that's December 27th, the Archbishop received a letter warning him of his danger, and all southeast Kent was in a state of suppressed ferment and ominous expectation. In the afternoon of December 29th, so that's today, in the year 1170, the knights from France came to him. There was an interview in which several demands were made, particularly that St. Thomas should remove the censors on the three bishops. It began quietly and ended angrily, the knights departing with threats and oaths. A few minutes later, shouting, breaking of doors, and cla clamor of arms was heard, and St. Thomas, urged the hus and hustled by his attendants, began to move slowly towards the church his cross carried before him. Vespers was being sung, and at the door of the north transept he was met by a crowd of terrified monks. Get back to choir, he exclaimed. I will not come in all the time you are standing here, standing there. They drew back a little, and as he entered the church, armed men were seen behind the dim light of the cloister. It was nearly dark. Monks slammed the door and bolted it, shutting out some of their brethren in the confusion. These beat loudly at the door. St. Thomas Becket turned around. Away, you cowards, he cried. A church is not a castle. And he reopened the door himself, meaning it's not to be closed to anybody. It's open to all to come. So what, what triggered this sending of the troops was when King Henry finally, annoyed with St. Thomas Becket, said, I can't even live in peace in my own country, in my realm, with except for this Thomas. Who will rid me of this Thomas? That's when the soldiers took it as a command, and they went all the way to Canterbury, which in those days would have been several days' trip. So he opens the door himself. Then he put up the... Then he went up to the steps towards the choir. Now the choir, it's not the, as most churches now, we associate the choir as sitting in the back with the organ. But that's not how the medieval churches were built. The choir was where the monks chanted the divine office. So it's, you have the main altar and then, and then the sanctuary and then the choir and then the main nave. Usually usually separated by what's called a holy rood, which was like um, almost an iconostasis, but a Latin one with a cross on it. So he walked towards the choir for Vespers. Only three were left with him, Robert, Prior of Merton, William Fitzstephen, and Ed Edward Grimm, his aged advisor and confessor, Edward Grimm. The rest had fled to the crypt and elsewhere, and soon the monk Grimm, Edward Grimm, alone remained. The knights who had been joined by a subdeacon named Hugh of Horsea ran in, shouting, Where is Thomas the traitor? Where is the archbishop? St. Thomas said, facing him, Here I am. No traitor, but archbishop and priest of God and came back down the steps, standing between the altars of Our Lady and St. Benedict. They shouted at him to, to absolve the bishops. I cannot do other than I have done, he answered. Reginald, you have received many favors from me. Why do you come into my church, armed? Fitzurse's reply was to threaten him with an axe. I am ready to die, said St. Thomas Becket, but God's curse be on you if you harm my people. Fitzurus seized his cloak and pulled him towards the door. St. Thomas Becket snatched himself clear. Then they tried to carry him outside physically, and he threw one of them to the ground. So um, I'm, I, di I didn't read out because it's a long biography. 
of his life. But St. Thomas Becket, there was a time when he did he, he fought in battles too and, and uh, was a good fighter in battle. So he, he was not uh, a wet noodle, that's for sure. So, so he threw him to the ground. And one of the knights, Fitzurs is his name, F-I-T-Z-U-R-S-E, Fitzurs, flung away his axe and drew his sword. You pander, exclaimed the archbishop. You owe me fealty and submission. I owe no fealty contrary to the king, Fitzurs shouted back. Strike, and he knocked off his mitre. St. Thomas Becket covered his face and called aloud on God and his saints. The knight Tracy struck a blow, which the other knight Grimm intercepted, which, excuse me, Tracy, one of the knights of the king, struck a blow, which the monk, the, the spiritual confessor of Thomas Becket, his name was Grimm, Edward Grimm, intercepted with his own arm, but it grazed St. Thomas's head and blood ran down into his eyes. St. Thomas Becket wiped the blood away, and when he saw the crimson stain, he cried, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Another blow from the knight Tracy beat him to his knees, and murmuring, St. Thomas saying these final words, For the name of Jesus and in defense of the church, I am willing to die. He pitched forward on to his face. Le Breton, with a tremendous stroke, another knight, Le, Pre Le Breton, with a tremendous stroke, severed his scalp, breaking his sword against the pavement, and Hugh of Horsia scattered the brains out of the skull with his own sword point. Hugh de Morville alone struck no blow. Then shouting, the king's men, the king's men, the murderers dashed away through the cloisters. The whole thing was over in ten minutes. While the great church filled with people and, thun and a thunderstorm broke overhead, the archbishop's body lay alone, stretched in the middle of the transept, and for long no one dared to touch or even to go near it. Even after making full allowance for the universal horror which such a deed of sacrilege, the murder of a metropolitan in his own cathedral, was bound to excite in the 12th century the indignation and excitement which soon spread throughout Europe and the spontaneous canonization of St. Thomas Becket by the common voice testified to the fact that the inner significance of his death was realized on all hands that a necessary vindication had been made of the rights of the church against an aggressive state, and that the Archbishop of Canterbury, in some ways an unsympathetic character, whose methods were not beyond reasonable criticism, was a martyr and worthy to be venerated as a saint. So later, the king, Henry II, would do public penance and he would repent of his action. So maybe in the long run, Henry II finally saved his soul. Maybe they're both in heaven now. We don't know. But we know one is, St. Thomas of Canterbury. So here's a Catholic bishop who stood up to a king. And we see in the history of the church, St. Ambrose stood up to Emperor Theodosius and said, you will not enter the basilica until you do public penance for massacring. Uh, he massacred a whole town, over 300 people. So this is what uh, the bishops have been required to do, not only in the state in our days against the, the godless states and governments, but now we've had bishops have, have had to stand up against the Pope. And this is something that no one would ever expect in the history of the Catholic Church, but we're living it now when Archbishop Lefebvre had to stand up to defend the Catholic faith and the Catholic Mass and the Catholic sacraments, he had to defend all the Catholic magisterium of tradition against the wreckers who took the throne of Peter, starting with John the Twenty-Third, then Pope Paul the Sixth, and then uh, Pope 
John, the, John Paul II with his a scandal of Assisi, gathering all the world religions, letting the Buddhas burn incense to a, a statue of the devil, the big fat Buddha is one of the devils, burning incense in a Catholic church. So Archbishop Lefebvre said, it's clear Rome has lost the faith. And he tried all those years to, to get get tradition to be freed. But he finally realized Rome is in darkness. He said it himself, Rome is in apostasy. And this is what motivated him to consecrate four bishops in 1988. And he always told the bishops, do not seek any agreements, do not seek any, any compromise with Rome until we have a perfectly Catholic Pope and until Rome comes back to tradition. And that's very clear. The, the marching orders were very, very clear. And they didn't keep those marching orders, the four sons of Archbishop Lefebvre, the four consecrated bishops. They didn't keep those orders. And, well, this is, well, this is where we are now with the new SSPX compromised on levels of doctrine with the doctrinal declaration, the six, the six conditions for the agreement with Rome precisely before Rome comes back to tradition. And it was Archbishop Lefebvre who told the Pope at the time in, in 1988, in the fall, he said, if Rome wants to dialogue, if one wants to uh, have more meetings, I will set the level. It will not any longer be, oh, can we have one more bishop? Can we have a church? Can we have this? Can we have that? No, he said, I will put it at the level of doctrine. And I, will t and I will say, as I've always said to Rome, if you don't accept the syllabus of errors, Pascendi, condemning modernism of Pius X, if you, don't con if you don't hold to the social kingship of Christ, as proclaimed by Quas Primas, if you don't hold to all the, the encyclicals of these popes who condemn the modern liberalism and modernism, then there's no agreement possible. Until, until Rome comes back to tradition, and Rome comes back in line with all the previous popes before, uh, from Pius XII beyond. So that was very clear, and Archbishop Lefebvre stood up to the pope, something that no one would ever expect, but he did, and we have to still hold that position, praying for the pope, but we resist him to the face. And this is what all traditional Catholics throughout the world are obliged to do. And not only the Pope, but the modernist bishops, and also the compromising bishops of tradition. We have to also oppose them. Bishop Follet, he has no right to destroy the work of Archbishop Lefebvre and Catholic tradition by putting it under the wings of modernist Rome and getting all these favors at the price of compromise on doctrine and with the new Mass. And that's Unfortunately, that's what it was done in 2012. And, of course, we cannot accept either those bishops who promote the new Mass, and new Mass miracles, and new Mass gives grace, and new Mass nourishes your faith. We have to oppose that also, because that's false teaching, it's dangerous teaching, and, and it confuses the faithful, and let alone saying that these are not the times for a seminary, when the first duty of a bishop is always to look after the future of the Catholic Church. His first duty should be seminaries, Catholic seminaries, good seminaries, like Archbishop Lefebvre. That was his first concern. So bishops who don't build seminaries and promote seminaries, they're practicing birth control, spiritual birth control, and they'll answer to God for that. So rather than saying this is not the time for seminaries, he should be saying... We need a seminary in every country, in every state. And all good bishops, especially the saints, canonized ones, always look first and for, foremost to the seminaries. And St. Pius X himself wrote encyclicals on the, the importance of seminaries and how to form good priests. So, well, we... We have to continue the fight of Catholic tradition until God steps in and the Blessed Virgin Mary. She promised that in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. Sister Lucia did say that will finally, a Pope will finally properly consecrate Russia. It will be done. 
and the period of peace, that is the social reign of Christ, will be issued in. Now, we're not there yet. We seem to be very far from it. But as things move quick, maybe we're getting closer. So let's, let's pray for all the bishops. Even among the Novus Ordo, there has been uh, a few bishops with some spine, like Bishop, Bishop Strickler, no, Bishop, um, um, Bishop Tyler, what's his last name? Strickland. Strickland. He stood up against the poison needle, and he, he spoke out against the shutting down of Father Pavone. So he has a little bit of spine, so pray for him. He would be a great traditional bishop. But he would probably have to be conditionally reordained to make sure he's a priest in tradition. He'd probably have to be conditionally reconsecrated as a bishop in tradition. Because with these new sacraments, you can't play with them because they are objectively doubtful. So in the meantime, we have to fight on and pray for the bishops. Pray that God give us good Catholic bishops, good bishops, and let alone a good pope. So let's storm heaven today. And pray also today, by the way, pray for um, a, a crippled man. His name was Paul. And uh, I brought him communion over the years, and he died today. So pray for his soul. He was always in a bed, always crippled, always quite sometimes miserable with, with that cross. So he died today. I gave him extreme unction a couple of months ago. And um, so I'll pray for his soul also. Paul. O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.